you know, there's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. Number 24 is Content Farms in Macedonia. Bidiki ako se napravi greška, tak je bide kobna. Nema vrakinja nazad. So, Europe need to, to remain more sexyple lady in the world. Ajde, majkata! Gospode, čuva Macedonija in izvinite grajke. Zoran Zaev tells Macedonians that his partner in crime and governance, Ali Ahmeti, has a big announcement to make on the 19th anniversary of the founding of his terrorist, er, sorry, political party, Dewey. Speculation runs from thoughts that Ahmeti is resigning from leadership because he will soon be going to The Hague to face war crimes charges, to the idea that both Dewey and Sidisim will field a joint candidate for mayor of Skopje in the upcoming fall mayoral elections. But when the big day, Saturday, June 5, arrives, Ahmeti announces that his party is adopting a, quote, green, unquote, agenda. At least he joins Zayev's, quote, green, unquote, agenda in the form of marijuana plantations for the Zayev family of the subsequent drug running that they engage in. We'll discuss all of this and more on this episode of the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. I'm Jason Miko, coming to you from the foot of the Catalina Mountains in Oral Valley, Arizona. And this is Svetin Shulimanov in Skopje, Macedonia. Svetin, we, um, I wrote this yesterday on Sunday. Today is Monday the... Today, the 7th, so this will drop on the 8th. This is episode number 115 of the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. And I wrote this yesterday, and then, you know, as is typical, nine-hour time difference between yeah. you and me, I, I go to bed and I wake up, and you've sent me this email with all this other stuff going on, uh, hmm. you know, the, the continuing Zayev racketeering scandals, uh, the, the issues with Bulgaria, Vomero protests. And then, I maybe we should start with this, um, Former U.S. ambassador to Bulgaria and um, general, how should we put him? He wasn't general. He was a colonel in the U.S. Army. But uh, mm-hmm. general tinkerer, shall we say, yeah. in the Balkans in general, James Pardue died. Yeah. Uh, the announcement just came out yesterday in, in the, the media, uh, although apparently he died on June 2nd uh, in Arlington, Virginia, a uh, place you know about. Um but I, I thought that was kind of interesting. He was 77 years old. Uh, I have his book right here, which came out about three years ago, and I haven't even opened it. I just got it in April. Peacemakers, American Leadership in the End of Genocide in the Balkans. Um, yeah, I know. Well, he was Bosnia, I suppose. He was involved he, in Bosnia as well. He was, right? well, he, yes, well, that's the thing. So he was involved in Bosnia. He was involved in Kosovo. He was involved in Macedonia. He was involved in... Bulgaria. He, he was, you know, it, it was first, it was Bill Clinton, U.S. President Bill Clinton, a thousand years ago in the 90s, late 90s, that named him as, a, I think he was the U.S. representative for military stabilization in the Balkans, mm-hmm. whatever that means. A Clinton uh, hand, definitely. Yeah, yeah, he was a Clinton hand. Um, now, again, he was in the mili- U.S. military for like 28 years, I believe, uh, before doing his diplomatic stuff. So, uh, originally from Arkansas. Uh, but then, yeah, involved in the Balkans and Bosnia. Um, the, I think it was the military training and equip program for Bosnia. Yeah, he was uh, 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 essentially sending arms to the Bosnians uh, yes. as a U.S. intelligence officer, uh, yeah. army intelligence officer, while, you know, they were pounded by the Serbs. And, uh, you know, this was under this theory that they, there needs to be a balance of, in heavy weaponry in artillery so that uh, Bosnians can resist the Serbian attacks and uh, in this way to end the war. Right, exactly. Yeah, actually, quick side side story. I've got I've got other stories about all of that from my time with um, Peter Galbraith, who was the U.S. ambassador to Croatia, mm. when we were doing Croatian tourism, which is a much longer story. But mm. I remember, you know, he he was the ambassador there, and so he sailed with us on some trips, which is a whole other story. But anyway, I remember him talking a little bit about the whole arms to the Bosnians program. And yep. some of that went through Croatia. Uh, so he is the U.S. ambassador there, facilitated it. Uh, anyway, that's, that's, getting, that's getting too deep uh, for this podcast. But back on Pardue. So he, yeah, after Bosnia, then I think he went on to be involved in, uh, well, Kosovo after the, uh, during the war there and whatnot. And then Macedonia during the war there. And then mm. Bulgaria during the war. Oh, wait, no, there wasn't a war in Bulgaria. Um, <laughs> but... He was very much involved in that. He was, 
you know, um, it's, it's proper for us to offer condolences to his family. He had, you know, a number of sons and daughters-in-law and grandkids, of course. But he was a very controversial figure in, in Macedonia, in Bulgaria, in the region. And uh, his, it, it's, it'll be interesting as I, as I read this book. We'll talk about it more in future podcasts as I kind of dive into this to see what he says. Obviously, I don't know if, if he was, I don't know what he passed away from, if he had cancer, if he knew he was dying and so he wanted to get this book out or not. Um, that's possible. But mm-hmm. uh, of all the U.S. ambassadors to Macedonia, I think he's, this is the, oh wait, he wasn't ambassador to Macedonia. He's yeah, ambassador he was Bulgaria, the ambassador. Ambassadors to the region and, and involved in Macedonia. So Chris Hill, obviously the first U.S. ambassador, has a book out a couple of years ago, Outpost. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, this is their way of, you know, cementing their legacy. By writing a book about it yeah in macedonia his legacy is that when the war started practically he and uh, uh, francois leotard a french diplomat who was afterwards you know hounded for corruption uh, the yes. two were named as the american and the eu envoys in the war perdue leotard uh, duo and they obviously you know well working with boris and uh, we knew on the receiving end of their efforts uh, they were uh, you know, very quickly uh, into the war, uh, we realized that their goal, their task practically in Macedonia is to uh, mm-hmm. politis- to to move the demands of the Albanian terrorists through the political process to practically force Macedonian parties to accept many of these demands and they practically pushed, they set the country on a, a path towards no longer being uh, a Macedonian nation state first, but mm-hmm. toward becoming uh, a Macedonian Albanian, not still still not a full federation, but uh, that's obviously coming just today. We have Ali Ahmeti making comments again about Switzerland. Now he says, I'm not talking about the territorial solution. I want to make Macedonia Switzerland as in green and developed and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I will get back to his green agenda later, yes, but uh, yes. these are clearly the oblique references to having a, a federal, a partition of Macedonia into an Albanian and uh, Macedonian or Albanian and Bulgarian cantons and uh, mm. dividing the, the country, which is the you know likely direction we are headed. And uh, you know this is why he's well, you know we can discuss his involvement in Bosnia. Maybe it was the right thing to end the war by arming the the Muslim side there, but um, then too quickly the Clinton administration adopted the, uh, or it, by then it was the Bush administration, but uh, mm-hmm. all the Balkan hands were handpicked by Clinton. Uh, too quickly, you know, the U.S. State Department uh, declared Macedonians in par with the Serbs when uh, the Albanians practically attacked Macedonia, started a, a war here, so we were quickly declared you know, as bad as the Serbs and the Albanians in Macedonia, as oppressed as the Albanians in Kosovo, justifying the war Ali Ahmeti started and uh, uh, moving to the Ohrid Treaty, which, uh, you know, practically gave uh, Albanians a greater political way in, uh, in parliament than a Macedonian member of parliament has, mm-hmm. um, turned uh, Ahmeti's criminal gang into a official part of the government, which can almost practically cannot be replaced, um, no matter how many votes the Macedonian party wins, uh, established this principle that the U.S. embassy is supporting the Albanians in Macedonia, all their demands, uh, no concession is uh, uh, too big when it's going to, it's to be demanded from Macedonians, whether toward Greece, Bulgaria, and especially toward the Albanians, uh, this led to the redrawing of municipal borders in uh, t- 2004, which practically serves as uh, the basis for the these uh, constantly bubbling up cl- demands for partition and federalization. Um, so yeah, I mean, in our view, the U.S. always takes the sides of the Albanians, the side of the Albanians, and uh, Perdue was the first American diplomat which practically uh, completely forcefully uh, took this position in Macedonia, uh, all, uh, supporting the Albanians against the Macedonians, followed by other heavy-handed diplomats like Butler immediately after the war and uh, Jess Bailey in uh, 2015, in the, ne- in, the, in the second great US-supported assault on Macedonia as a Macedonian nation-state and against 
Vermeer in both cases in 2001 and 2015, the US practically supported efforts to bring down the Vermeer led government with huge cost to Macedonia. Bravo. That was an excellent rant. Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> you, you covered a lot of ground there, my yeah. friend. Uh, and, I, and I think it's interesting to note at the same time that um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Macedonia, uh, the Minister Bugiro Osmani, has just put out its list of um, uh, 30 personalities mm. uh, coming up on the 30th uh, anniversary of the independence of the Republic of Macedonia's modern-day nation-state. Uh, Pardue, of course, is on that list, as is, interestingly, James, uh, Larry Butler, who, um, you know, a few podcasts ago, we kind of rejoiced in the fact that I think we had something to do with kicking <laughs> him off of Twitter, or forcing him <laughs> off of Twitter. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and then you mentioned... He was, uh, he was not for Twitter, anyway. No, he wasn't, yeah. He was uh, kind of a wimp. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned Francois Lyotard. Also, Alain Leroy uh, is on that list. Yeah. Um, it, actually, it's kind of funny. As I, as I go through this list of 30, um, a full 20% of them are dead, um, <clears throat> which I just find interesting. But what's also interesting is this is something that um, um, the United Macedonian Diaspora pointed out, that it's a shame that people like U.S. Senator George Voinovich and Richard Luger, who were friends of Macedonia... Mm are not on that list at all, of course. Uh, I wouldn't expect them to be. And one final point before we move on to another subject. Um, since we are talking about interference and, and your rant there about what um, various U.S. Uh, diplomats, unelected uh, folks have done to Macedonia over the years, um, this website that I'm looking at, BalkanEU.com, which is has the list of 30 personalities, mm -hmm. uh, the byline is, quote, by North Macedonian Newsroom, unquote, uh, which is a, a favorite rant of mine recently about how uh, <clears throat> this list I keep of, of how the PRESPA agreement has uh, created North Macedonians and yeah. everything that should be simply Macedonian as North Macedonian, or in the case of NATO and the European Union, who cannot bring themselves to say Macedonian this, that, or the other, they must say North Macedonia fill in the blank, um, which again goes to your point of eroding identity, which uh, yeah. we will uh, have more to say about and I'll have more to write about uh, very soon. So, yeah. uh, anyways, so that's... Of the, of, the whole, uh, yeah, yeah. of the whole list there, I mean, the only person who I remember actually strongly supporting Macedonian rights vis-a-vis -vis Greece, Macedonian rights to a Macedonian state, is, the, I think he was dead last on the list. The... the a German ambassador. Hans Lothar Stepan. Yeah. yeah. He's the only yeah, okay. one. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever met him. Um, yeah, me neither, not personally, but yeah, he's the only yeah. person I would say fondly remembered. In. He, he, his books, actually, on yeah. Macedonia is, <laughs> is the one we I, should read. <laughs> yes, well, I do say, I see Peter uh, Faith, Faith or Faith, or I'm not sure, I've never mm. been sure how you pronounce his name, but he, um, he actually has, if memory recalls, if, if my memory is correct, he actually has Ali Ahmeti's uniform yeah, from uh, exactly. when he was uh, the, the uh, in L.A. So yep. uh, he's probably an older man, too. He's the, Half of these people are on their way out. Um, mm. And when I say out, I mean out of this world. So, mm. uh, But uh, anyway, um, that is that is the news that we just, or I just learned overnight. Um, interesting. Again, he's, he passed away on the 2nd, and they're, they're just reporting it on mm. the 6th. Today's the 7th. Um, let's, let's move over to, um, um, what I started with, uh, in the monologue, the topic of, uh, that I thought we would be, that would dominate this podcast, which, which hasn't yet is that's the green thing. And I think it's interesting <laughs> because, and this, you know, for our listeners, we don't always, Sven and I don't always agree on everything. And, uh, in our, in our pre, um, in our preparation for this, I had emailed you and said, I think this is a big mistake for Dewey going green mm -hmm. you had the came back with the point that it, it's a really big deal in europe writ large yep. you mentioned uh, obviously the upcoming german elections in september where it looks like the greens are in the lead right now well, i think there was a, a regional election yesterday somewhere in germany um and i'm not sure uh, it was one of the eastern states Saxony Saxony, I think, and they yeah. won easily it was yeah. uh, i mean the the right it was uh, Miracles party and then the far right afterwards. So oh, okay. it wasn't. Uh, yeah, 
a typical but, yeah. election. But, but the green the green issue, and, and of course I'm speaking as an American, um, the green issue here in terms of politics and political parties, uh, obviously we're a two-party country at the federal level and even mm -hmm. at the state level. You get green candidates that get elected to city councils and town councils and things yeah. like that, maybe even some county seats. But I, I don't think there's ever been a federally elected official from the Green Party. Yeah. I might be wrong, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's big in the media. I should say the mainstream media here, environment and green and all that, fine. Uh, and that's, that's important. Look, we're conservatives, and so we, we believe that, you know, what God said in Genesis to, to take care of and yeah. conserve the world and, and, and everything that's in it. And, and so I can make a conservative case. You can make a conservative case for protecting the environment. That's all. That's absolutely. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the voters' minds, at least here in America, it doesn't make, you know, the top five in terms of what people are concerned about. Uh, now, maybe in Europe it does. We'll see, as we just alluded to, to the, to the German elections this fall. But in Macedonia, I think, and you tell me if I'm wrong, um, obviously you, you know more about this, uh, the whole idea of Alechmeti, Dewey, a, for, a, a party born out of a terrorist organization that murdered people and traffics, trafficked or traffics yeah. in women, girls, drugs, uh, guns, weapons, etc., going green. It's it's almost like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, he's 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 grabbed a, a you know a Winnie the Pooh bear and he's hugging it, and it's just odd. I don't think it's going to yeah, yeah. fly with his constituents. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, the, okay. the best known their mayors in Macedonia, they're known, you know, in, in Tetovo, the the city has no water, even though it's underneath the Shar Mountain, and uh, uh, it's grossly overdeveloped and uh, the one actual environmental move in Tetovo which Dewey led was to close the Yugochrom plant but it's uh, uh, because it mainly employs Macedonians it was like a mm. F you to the Macedonians and right. trying to expel as many of them uh, from the working class Macedonians from the area then uh, rather than you know actual care for air quality which uh, hasn't improved a, a, a millimeter after the the the, the smelter was closed. It's actually mm -hmm. outside of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, the smelter in uh, Struga, they're notorious for, you know, overbuilding uh, um, wherever, you know, along the uh, Lake Ohrid, wherever they want, uh, mm -hmm. wherever uh, a developer you know, pays the, the mayor enough money, you know, you, you can build whatever you want. And besides, uh, the, uh, under the Dewey mayor of Struga, Ramiz Mirko, a, a practice is now that developers who want to build like a new beach along the shore, they just mm. burn the vegetation on the lake. Mm. And mm. Uh, so it's a, a running joke whenever there is like a fire. And then like a few days later, somebody comes in and starts building like uh, uh, pit, putting uh, parasols and uh, beach bars and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so in, in Ohrit as well, the Albanian, uh, they don't do it, does not run the city, but their guy in the city is notorious for like building a, uh, uh, a factory for concrete, you know, like a separation for, for concrete on the right on the shore of the lake. So it's a big issue with UNESCO coming, saying that there is huge environmental degradation of the region, that um, they attribute this to Dewey. Illegal logging is a huge deal uh, in Albanian parts of the Albanian majority parts of the country with armed gangs, uh, you know, cutting down um, even to the point that, you know, uh, Titova had horrific floods, uh, it's been like years ago, uh, which, you know, everybody in Albanian media and Macedonian media said, well, what did you expect? Like people were killed in Shipkovic, I think it was, in the village, mm. uh, in a huge mudslide, and everybody was like, but yeah, we locked, the, you know, we cleared the forest, and uh, of course this is going to happen. So yeah, he's, it's, a, it's a joke, but then on the other hand, uh, Dewey never actually developed an ideological platform other than exactly. more Albanians in public administration, more Albanians. More stuff for uh, us. At the government, heat, heat and uh, more yep. businesses under our control. Uh, I was once in Brussels with this uh, ridiculous German-Greek uh, liberal member of European Parliament, Shotsi Markakis, and 
uh, Ermira Mehmeti was there. I don't know, some capacity. It was 10 years ago. I remember it was during the Tea Party time. Everybody was excited oh, about yeah. left and right. And, mm -hmm. and Shatsi was asking Ermira, okay, I'm new to this, to the Macedonia bit, obviously. A Greek, he was recruited by, the, by Greece to be undermining Macedonian positions in the parliament. And, but he, as a German, he was named an official rapporteur for Macedonia, like a neutral, ostensibly person. So he says, where do you stand politically, ideologically? And she says, well, we used to be in coalition with ASDSM, they were left, and now we're in coalition with Vimera, they're right. So <laughs> she had <laughs> nothing independent to add to the story. Yeah. It was just like, uh, we just, we are an ethnic clan and... Uh, uh, we just we, we joined the left coalition, the right coalition. We don't care. But in Macedo in, in Europe, uh, you know, the social democratic idea is largely dead. It's very difficult for them to keep this charade that they're the party of the working people. Working people are voting right or nationalist more and more. Uh, the social democrats are party of uh, urban elites and uh, college educated people and the minorities. And the greens are moving in, into the same racket as a fresher, less corrupt, because they haven't been in power, version of the Social Democrats, and they're very successful. So they practically grabbed uh, the, the place preserved for the Social Democrat opposition in Austria. Uh, and now they are, there is the Black-Green coalition there. And they're on the verge in Germany now, because they avoided being entangled like, a, like the Social Democrats in the Merkel cabinets. Mm -hmm. so they, had this cozy position of still always criticizing the right and the left uh, from a position of never being actually in power. So they were building up this reputation, uh, you know, never tainted by corruption, always, uh, uh, you know, the smartest, always know what to do. <laughs> so they're now in a great position to possibly even best Angela Merkel's party now that Angela Merkel is leaving. Uh, Finally. In the next elections, yeah. <laughs> And uh, Ahmed is positioning himself, practically there is going to be, and there is a lot of talk that this is now the US sponsored movement, because in the past the Greens were obviously the Russia sponsored party, they were against nuclear weapons, against uh, oil and gas, coal mining, so everything that makes Europe and America dependent on Russia and other countries for energy, disarmed, against foreign wars, foreign entanglements. Uh, their social agenda is obviously drugs and even pedophilia in Germany for a mm. long time, uh, uh, abolishing any morality, decency, family values, etc. And now, you know, they are also very good fit with the modern American left. So they're, they're, they have adopted in Germany this anti-Russian uh, posture, which is ridiculous for, you know, given their history, but still. So Ahmed is position, positioning himself to be part of a pro-American uh, wave of green parties, <laughs> no matter how ridiculous <laughs> that it, sounds it, in, in Macedonia. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's just bizarre because, again, you know, if, if, if he actually runs on this as a platform, it'll be interesting to see if they actually come up with some sort of a platform and, and a list of things that, that they want to do that they believe will contribute to a more, quote-unquote, green Macedonia. Um, I don't... Now, they've got a certain control over their constituency, and they they tell them to vote, but uh, and how to vote, and when to vote, and where to vote, and how many to vote, etc. But um, I, I don't know if, you know, once they get behind the, in the uh, in the voting booth, if they're actually going to vote for them on this. Whereas at the same time, I, th I, I believe that um, the, uh, the other uh, opposition uh, ethnic Albanian parties in Macedonia, AA and, um, was it Vesa? Um, uh, it's yeah. been so long since we uh, talked about them. Um, AA and uh, alternative for India position and base right. is with SDSM. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna go hard nationalist, um, hard. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and and so it'll be interesting to see in the contest between them in these upcoming local elections in the fall uh, how this green <laughs> this green agenda yeah, works yeah. out for uh, <laughs> Ahmed. It just it, it did. I mean, when I saw that news, uh, I laughed out loud. I, I thought yeah, it was yeah. hilarious. I, <laughs> Absolutely. People were joking, as you said, uh, is this the marijuana, is this the dollars from racketeering they're doing? But I think in the end, listen, the Albanians vote for them uh, under pressure with ballot yeah. stuffing on a clan or family loyalties or just for getting jobs through Dewey. Uh, and 
this will be mostly for them because they still haven't been able to develop like a European Union affiliation. Like uh, Vemera has the EPP, although you know by right it should be in the new group uh, which Orban is making. Amen. Has the uh, has the social democratic movement. Uh, do we have nothing of this? Uh, they, they used to declare themselves as Marxists. Uh, given their approach to governance, they should be with the social democrats. But uh, you know, it's a it's a savvy move for them to just if they're accepted in a in the green co- uh, group of European parties, they can just get some kind of solidarity. And especially, you know, if they if this movement if this uh, coalition now gains Germany. Mm-hmm. the prime ministership of Germany, then <laughs> that's a big deal. True. Well, that this this will be we will keep following this. It'll be interesting. Just one last thing on this, um, as you know, we've talked about in the past and have written about. Obviously, the um, the the ethnic Albanian parties in Macedonia don't have a, and as we just talked about, don't have an ideology. It's just it's about what can we get for our constituency, and yeah. it has nothing to do with forward future thinking about you know the path. The, the development path for Macedonia, foreign direct investment, job creation, wealth creation, which is done at the private sector, not at the gov- not not by the government, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and not and this is why I think you know the 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 ethnic Albanian parties in Macedonia have always been cult of personality parties, whereas mm. you know Vomero and Sidisem, respectively, uh, despite the faults that both of them have, at least do have an ideology that they they uh, put forward. Um, and as yeah. soon as you know, as soon as Zorn, uh, sorry, as soon as Ali Ahmeti goes, whether it's mm-hmm. you know uh, to the Hague or once he leaves this world, um, his party will fall apart. Uh, that's just the way it works. I mean, remember yeah. Arvind Jaffery, DPA. I mean, so yeah. Mendu yeah. in charge, but what he's got one, two seats. He is, was the bar- biggest party in, Ma- in ethnic Albanian party in Macedonia, yeah. and it's gone. Emir Ameri, PDP, gone. Um, you know. That's just what happens when these people literally die. Their parties die with them. So, yeah, um, yeah. anyway. Um, all right. I think we've flogged the green stuff to death here. Um, <laughs> we'll just keep monitoring that. Uh, the other thing that um, we wanted to, to touch on was, uh, I guess, continuing, you know, Zayev scandals. Um, this one I don't know as, as much about. And then we'll talk, uh, we'll close out with uh, Bulgaria and, and Vomero and, yeah. and whatnot. So, what... You, now you mentioned in our in our pre uh, pre conference or pre call uh, email and whatnot the racketeering scandal. I I kind of glossed over this one, I guess. Yeah, it's there are so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm to I'm to be forgiven. <laughs> yeah, well, this was actually known. It was uh, known that uh, obviously a huge business in Macedonia is um, coal mining in the Bitolite provides like. Uh, 70% of our energy, domestically produced energy, which is about 70 to 80% of all consumption. So it's, you know, huge deal in terms of cash flow. And uh, mm-hmm. if you remember, Grievski was being charged by Katica Yaneva over allegedly, you know, giving, uh, assigning contracts who will get to mine the, the coal to businessmen. And as soon as Zayev grabbed power, immediately one of the companies, there were three companies mining the coal, one of them was uh, lost the contract, mm-hmm. uh, was kicked out of the contract, and it was given to a company which everybody knows is run by Vitsa Zayev, Zoran Zayev's brother. Um, the other company uh, which had the contract, its owner uh, was telling diplomats and then quickly denied this when it became public that he's being extorted. So practically SDSM appointed a SDSM official to run the mine, and they started extorting money from the uh, mining companies and um, moving the contracts directly under their thumb, uh, under Vitsa Zav's, Zoran Zav's brother's thumb. But what's new now is that the Mitskovsky produced a, a police report, hmm. uh, which a, a statement from one of the owners of these companies, the, the company which lost the contract altogether, in which he directly says that Vitsa Zav was uh, in, inviting him for a meeting. Uh, then uh, didn't show up, then started sending emissaries to him with clear orders to stop doing the contract, like withdraw, like say, sorry, I can't uh, meet the terms of the contract, which would be suicide for the company, obviously. Then when uh, the owner refused, uh, Vitezaev started telling him, uh, give me 250,000 euros in cash Hmm. as reimbursement. And uh, the guy 
he says, I, st I stopped practically. I st started avoiding them. He would say that he's hiking in the mountain with no internet access and no cell coverage <laughs> <laughs> to avoid them. And eventually he got a message, you will see what will happen to you. And what happened was that his trucks, his equipment, his drivers, his workers were being were stopped from entering the the mine, the the premises, and eventually, in just a few months, were ordered to, you know, were informed that their contract is taken away from them. And shortly after, the contract was given to uh, Vitsazav's company. Mm -hmm. So the new moment is that this 2018 police statement statement the owner gave to the police was. Uh, received by organized crime of officers, detectives, uh, and then it was given to the prosecutors uh, in a, in the, uh, in a forged practically form. One mm. page was ripped out, replaced with another. Vitsa Zaev is replaced with Vitsa N, so the last name, the initial for the last name is changed from Z to N to obscure who was doing the extortion. Mm. And uh, practically the saucy parts were removed from the statement and the the head of the organized crime in the interior ministry was recently removed so it's now rumored it was rumored in the past that even though SDSM appointed that he was helping Orza Kamchev protect himself from racketeering from uh, Katica Yanova in the racket scandal and that now practically he uh, was uh, that either he uh, refused to alter the text uh, and was removed or uh, that he did this, but you know, kept the original, so continued to be a threat to Zaev. So yeah, we have a, a very interesting scandal in that there is now an official paper trail mm. of uh, a report, a direct report against Vitsa Zaev, Zaev's brother, which was left uninvestigated by the police, and the, the officer who was in charge of this was removed, while at the same time this was forwarded to prosecutor Vilma Ruskovska, no. who is supporting Zaev most of the time, but she did uh, hit out against, uh, first against Yaneva and now against Draghi Rashkovsky, two people very close to Zaev. So Zaev is not really sure in her loyalty. And mm -hmm. uh, there is now talk that sh there might be a push to have her replaced. Uh, <laughs> she's trying to defend herself in this whole thing. She says that she did not receive the original statement. She's still not committing to investigating Vitsa Zaev, but this is now another scandal which is hitting too close to home for Zaev. Man, it is, um, and I laughed earlier when I said I could be <laughs> forgiven uh, because there are just so many of these scandals and th yeah. they seem to get so close to Zaev and his family. Um, I do find it interesting, going back to, the, to Akhmeti, that they rarely touch him, uh, Although we know that that Ali Ahmeti and Dewey are involved in many, many, many scandals, one way or the other, mm. um, that's why my favorite picture of Ali Ahmeti is in his uh, is in his office uh, with the uh, money counting machine in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does Proper he need that gangster for? style. Yeah. <laughs> all all he needs there in the picture is like a digital scale for drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, Zayev, it, it just seems to get so close to him. People around him obviously have gone to jail. Most famous being Yaneva, Katiti Yaneva, the uh, the chief prosecutor. Uh, and yet, you know, it it, it hasn't hit him yet. Um, <clears throat> but all of this, I think, leads to. I, I understand that that Vomero has now announced uh, a series of protests, daily protests, beginning tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Uh, not just because of the scandals that are going on, but because of you know the continuing uh, attempt to erode Macedonia's identity and history and culture and language, uh, and give in to the childish, churlish, spurious demands of the Bulgarians. Uh, so Vomero's announced uh, what, a series of how many protests daily, from three to five. I understand. Uh, for what the next ten days in Skopje and uh, ten I think cities, it's five to seven, or okay. I may be wrong. And mm -hmm. um, it's going to be three locations in Skopje and uh, uh, like ten uh, cities in Macedonia, three places around Skopje yeah. is what I'm reading. Okay, yeah. So daily, yeah. Uh, again to protest the government. More on the the scandals. You know, seem people seem to have become, um, you know, uh, they just accept it as a part of life with Zayev, but on the whole issue with Bulgaria, because right now we've got Buchko, uh, Vladimir Buchkovsky, the 
special, or whatever his title is, uh, going back and forth to uh, to Sophia. Uh, you've got this this paper, non paper roadmap. What do you call it? I don't know. That I think the Bulgarians put forward. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, the the non paper refers to what uh, allegedly Slovenia put forward, oh. which is yeah, we discussed this before that it's like uh, a fake controversy by Zaev that uh, you know it's not the Albanian threat to Macedonia or any other of the neighbors. It's a little Slovenia oh, trying right. to mm-hmm. ruin his yeah. glorious foreign policy successes. Uh, but uh, Bulgarians they had like a resolution. I think it's called the Par- Parliament Declaration. I think officially where all the parties, even the Turkish party in uh, Bulgaria, the, they all agreed that uh, Macedonia needs to accept demands. Yeah, uh, there's another. Such as uh, <clears throat> national identity right. language and uh, historic figures and chunks of our history that uh, they belong to Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, this is now a consensus position in which you now the Bulgarian government says, listen, we are just a caretaker government, we can't change this. We can't negotiate with you. The, all the parties <coughs> agreed. So you need to meet all the demands before you open accession talks. Uh, and they have elections in July. And Zaf is hoping for some breakthrough until the 20-something of June, when the European Council meets. Yeah. So there is no new movement mm-hmm. on this. But Mitskovsky today said that he's having reports that there actually is. And that... Um, 23rd. I, mean, uh, I don't know how to put this... Right. Um, Mitskovsky says that uh, we are going to agree that uh, this is now part of the accession talks of the negotiating process that we, we meet all Bulgarian demands. He says it's either going to be in writing or uh, verbally that uh, we commit to these things, uh, that uh, we will make concessions on uh, the origin of Macedonian assassination, that we were Bulgarians mm-hmm. until 40, 1940-something, origin of the Macedonian language, that it was Bulgarian dialect until 1940-something, when it was codified as Macedonian, that all the historic figures were Bulgarians, from, you know, the Slavic settlement until 1945. This is what Bulgaria wants. Now, to what extent can we avoid this becoming an official part of the EU accession talks? I don't know, because Mm. from our experience with Greece, all it takes is a new member state to say, we want this from a candidate state and we will veto until it uh, uh, accept it, accepts it. And that's de facto part of the accession process. I mean, uh, at least with Greece, we were advised that we need to accept this, that this is the way it is. And this is, uh, you know, you ha- the, the strong did what they uh, wanted and, you know, the weak mm-hmm. suffered what they must. Um, so um, I don't think the EU needs Macedonian approval of this uh, if Bulgaria persists in vetoing accession talks for long enough it will de facto become part of the EU accession talks but there is now a worry that Zaf will actually sign some document that will actually agree that there is an additional a new chapter of the accession talks uh, which was done with some countries like for Serbia they have an additional chapter which is called Kosovo in our case it would be called Bulgaria or you know uh, bending over backwards to all your neighbors, uh, which are in the EU. Uh, whether Zaf mm. will sign something in this regard, I don't know. But Mitskovsky already did this once. Zaf practically announced concessions to Bulgaria <laughs> with his interview at the start of the year. What was it in February, I think? And um, of course he will. From where started protests, and this was uh, practically Zaf didn't move any forward with uh, his mm-hmm. announced concessions. Mm-hmm. Now... Well, the protests stopped Zayev last time, so that's the hope this time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, if... Uh, and if Zayev checks out for some other reason, like uh, divisions in his own party, then, again, it will uh, be, uh, you know, a, a score for Vimura because, you know, they were they're protesting and... Uh, it's, it has good chances of succeeding because I don't think, I'm not sure if this government is able to, in Bulgaria, is able to actually agree to any deal. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and um, I mean, it's, 
the other thing we didn't mention, of course, also is that uh, Albania is being held back as well from opening the session talks to the EU because Macedonia and Albania are supposed to go as a package. Uh, there's been talk about separating them, but it doesn't seem that there's the will of the European Union movers and shakers want to do that. Uh, we've got a change in um, the rotating EU presidency coming up from um, uh, Portugal gosh, to Slovenia. Thank you, Portugal to Slovenia at the beginning of July. Uh, we got the, the elections in Bulgaria on July 11. So uh, I have this scenario in my mind that it's going to be an Israeli type uh, thing where they just have to do elections every six months <laughs> <laughs> because the result yeah. is still the same. Uh, what does this mean? I, you know, I don't know. It, it, as we've talked about before and, and others have as well, I don't think EU membership is worth it yeah. uh, if you're. You, I mean, you can't. And plus, you know, again, you know, Orwell's quote that some ideas are so stupid, only intellectuals will believe them. This idea that press would solve all problems, well, obviously not. I think it's created more problems, to be honest. And I saw that the German foreign minister, um, Heiko Maas, came out and said that the EU needs yeah. to end the, this idea of foreign policy by un, un, unanimity. Uh, well, too late, too little. Too little, too late. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's that... that uh, that train has, that that cat has left the train station to mix my metaphors. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so ain't gonna happen. So um, anyway, well, let's do this. I know you got to run. Um, we'll see how these protests go. We'll join up again next week and, and see if that's moved the needle one way or the other. Anyway, and um, and when we got a couple of things we want to talk about. Uh, that we didn't get a chance to talk about on this podcast, but we'll save that for the next Yeah, time. we can try doing some kind of like a reading series and uh, with our commentary yeah. or viewing yes, series. Yes, I like it. Yeah. I like it. So, all right, yeah. and we'll have a farmer's pick next week as well. Yeah, promise. All right. Yeah. Good talking okay, to you, Sven. You too. Take care. Take care.